Abigail, you also mentioned something important here is that, and again, this is the second time we've come around to it. It's just sort of that there's an underestimate of those with PTSD out there. The same goes for suicide. We have around 50,000 suicides per year in the United States, and there has never been a time in American history, any anyone in the developed world, any state or any country, where they've suppressed the suicide rate by even, let's say, 25% and kept it at that level. So for all intents and purposes, we have about as much control over suicide as we do the coronavirus. In fact, we might actually have better control over the coronavirus from a public health perspective than we do suicide because we know social distancing and masks work, but uh, we're still struggling with solutions for suicide. And and uh, this kind of taps into one of the uh, one of the barriers or problems we found with the way the military and the VA run their suicide prevention programs. They're only focused on the terminal variable of death by suicide. They're not tracking attempts as well and any other upstream antecedent events. Now, to their credit, it's hard to track these things. Um, but, but we know that the suicides are an underestimate as well. People will avoid seeking help for any kind of mental health problem when they're in the military because they don't want it to have an impact on their career. They want to deploy. They want to keep serving. Uh, if they use a firearm in the context of their daily job, they don't want that removed. So we see lots of um, sort of like reverse malingering where it's like, no, no, I'm fine. It's only a flesh wound, right? Like, I'm fine. I'm fine. There's no issue um, when there really are issues. Um, and so actually that that is a fairly good segue to the project that we're involved with now. Uh, we're going on our third year. It's a research study in coordination with the University of Utah's National Center for Veteran Studies, uh, Dr. Craig Bryan, who he's actually the prior executive director within the last year, he's moved to Ohio State now. So the project started with Utah and is now with Ohio State. And <clears throat> we are working with the Air Force base that has the worst suicide rates in the entire Air Force world. So whether the bases are overseas or here, they have the worst suicide problem. And, and what we're using partly to get around this issue of, of people avoiding treatment is it's a peer-to-peer -peer intervention. So it's training pe peers who volunteer, their other airmen uh, of any rank who say, yeah, I'd, I'd like to be a peer mentor, teaching them about how to identify the signs of suicide, how to talk to people, how to do a crisis response plan with their, their fellow service members. This is outside of getting them any medical help. So that what we're doing is equipping and arming their the, the peers, because let's be honest, there are more peers than there are docs and, yeah. and social workers and psychologists, right? And and we know they are going to trust each other because they're sort of in the thick of things together day in and day out. They're going to trust each other more than they're going to trust the medical folks who, by the way, have the administrative authority to separate them or to put them on what's called a profile or limited duty, which means you can't deploy. And so we're in the third year and uh, a big component of the sort of due out or the, the um, report at the end is going to involve digital standard acceleration charts and looking at over the course of the three years, how the peer to peer intervention can be measured on the standard acceleration chart. So uh, b both for suicides, but also antecedents like attempts and other uh, related behaviors. So we're excited about it. And, and, and of yeah. course, in the next six months, we'll, we'll actually have some of the data crunched and, and we'll have some, some conclusions to, to share.